Hey there, students. Are you looking for a fun and easy way to revise all your chapters before your board exams? Well, you've come to the right place. In this video, you are going to find all your summaries for your chapters from first flight. Listening is a great way to revise all the small details, themes and characters from your chapters. So what are you waiting for? Let's get started. As you can see today, we will be going over a letter to God from First Flight. So without further ado, let's get to it. So A Letter to God is a story written by G. L. Fuentes, which depicts the firm faith of a poor and simple-minded farmer named Lencho in God. So Lencho was poor yet a very dedicated farmer. He was hoping for a decent harvest. But to his dismay or disappointment, a hailstorm suddenly came and completely destroyed all of his crops and his harvest. Seeing the damage, the poor farmer was taken aback and he felt very sad. However, he had a strong faith in God. He was a learned man who knew how to read and write. Due to his straightforward nature, he was certain that God would definitely help him out in the situation. So, he decided to draft a letter to God and addressed his financial concerns to him. In the letter, he requested God to send him 100 pesos to sow his field again and save his family from starvation. Soon, he wrote the letter and went to the post office placed a stamp on the letter and dropped it into the mailbox. When the postman took out the letter from the letterbox, he laughed after reading it. He immediately rushed to the postmaster and showed him this strange letter that was addressed to God. The postmaster read the letter and laughed out loud when he noticed this. However, he was also really moved by the faith of the farmer and the faith with which the letter was written to God. So he lauded the poor farmer's unquestionable faith in God and he decided to help him out. Soon he asked all the employees of the post office to contribute some money as charity and also gave a part of his own salary so that Lencho's faith in God is not shaken. However, the money collected was a little less than what Lencho had requested from God. The postmaster then put all of this money in an envelope and addressed it to the poor farmer. The following Sunday, Lencho went to the post office to check if there was a letter for him. The postmaster gently handed over the letter to Lencho. Lencho was not surprised at all to see the letter with the money inside the envelope because he was confident that God would help him out. So he opened the envelope to count the money but became angry when he saw that the money in the envelope was only 70 pesos, whereas he had requested for 100 pesos. He was sure that God could have never made such a mistake. He instantly went to the window to ask for paper and ink and wrote another letter to God and dropped it into the letterbox. When Lenjo had left the place, the postmaster opened and read his letter immediately. In it, Lencho had raised a complaint to God that he had initially requested for 100 pesos, but he was upset to find 70 pesos only. He then criticized the post office employees and he felt that it is them who, who have stolen the remaining 30 pesos from his envelope. He urged God to send him the rest of the money since he was in dire need of it. However, he requested God not to send the money through the mail because Lencho thought that the post office employees were a bunch of crooks who might have stolen the remaining money from the envelope. That brings us to the end of our summary. Now, a quick reminder before we get started, if you're liking these sessions and finding them helpful, do leave a comment or like the video so that we know that you like these videos. All right, now I hope you're ready for your summary of Nelson Mandela Long Walk to Freedom. Let's get to it. So Nelson Mandela Long Walk to Freedom is an extract from the autobiography of Nelson Mandela that describes the struggle for freedom of black people in South Africa. 
On 10th May 1994, Nelson Mandela took the oath as South Africa's first black president after more than three centuries of white rule. Nelson Mandela assured his fellow countrymen that his country would never experience similar suppression by one group over another. While taking his vow as the first black president, he established democracy in the country and said there would be no discrimination of people irrespective of caste, colour, creed or race. He assured that the government would always treat all the people of the country with due respect and equality. He calls it a common victory for justice, for peace, for human dignity. He says that it has taken the sacrifice of thousands of courageous people to overturn the policy of apartheid. Now, apartheid was a political system in South Africa that separated people according to their race. So it discriminated against black people and white people, where white people had superiority and black people were treated unfairly. So the lovely day of inauguration was symbolic for Mandela as the South African people sang two national anthems. The vision of whites sang Nkosi Sikelel e Africa and black sang Die Stem, the old anthem of the Republic. All these events reminded Mandela how the black-skinned people were exploited by the white people earlier. He deeply felt the pain of his race and said that this type of suppression and racial domination of the white-skinned people against the dark-skinned people on their own land gave rise to one of the harshest and most inhumane societies of the world had ever seen. He strongly believed that no person is born to hate the other person on the basis of just skin colour, background or religion. He says that people must learn to hate initially because if they learn to hate, they can be taught to love as well. As love actually comes more naturally to humans than hate. He also mentioned how a person becomes brave, not because he does not feel afraid, but because he knows how to conquer his fears. Mandela also stated that every man has two major obligations in life. The first one being towards his family, that is parents, wife and children. And the second obligation towards his motherland, countrymen and community. These are the twin obligations. Everyone is able to fulfill those obligations according to their own interests and inclinations. However, it was difficult to fulfill both these obligations as a black man in a country like South Africa before the democratic wave took over the nation by storm. When Mandela became an adult, he realized that freedom was merely an illusion and temporary in nature for the black-skinned people of his country. According to Mandela, freedom was indivisible for all. But the people of his colour and race were bound in chains of oppression and tyranny. He knew that the oppressor must be liberated just like the oppressed. Because a person who snatches another's freedom is also a prisoner of similar oppression. Thus the oppressor is not free too and feels shackled in the chains of oppression himself. That brings us to the end of our summary. There is so much to learn because Nelson Mandela was such an inspirational person and you should read the entire autobiography whenever you get the time. So today we will be covering first from the uh, your textbook, First Flight, Chapter 3, two stories about flying, okay? So let's get started with the first story about flying, which is his first flight. So the story, His First Flight, is written by Liam O. Flahetley and is based on a young seagull who was afraid to make his first flight because he feared that his wings wouldn't, you know, support him while flying. All of his siblings took the plunge to fly fearlessly in the open air despite having shorter wings than him. On the contrary, the young bird could not muster up the courage to take the plunge due to distrust in his wings. Whenever he tried to come forward towards the brink of the ledge while attempting to fly, he became afraid and then he went back. Uh, 
His parents constantly threatened him that unless he flew away, he would have to starve alone on the ledge. But all their efforts went in vain. He would just watch his parents teaching his siblings how to skim the waves and dive for fish. So one fine day, the whole family walked around the big plateau and taunted the young seagull for his cowardice. As the sun rays blazed on his ledge, he could feel the heat and was starving since the previous nightfall. The young bird begged his mother to bring him some food. He uttered a joyful scream when his mother quickly picked up a piece of fish and then flew across to him. He leaned out eagerly and jumped at the fish because he was exasperated by hunger. Suddenly, he fell outward in the open space and a monstrous terror seized him as he could feel that he was falling downward. The next moment, he felt his wings spread outwards and he was able to fly fearlessly. Finally, the young seagull took his first flight and soared higher and skimmed through the waves and dived along with his siblings. So essentially, he got over his fear thanks to his family and took his first flight. Alright, now it's time for part two, which is the second story about flying, which is the black aeroplane. So, Black Aeroplane is a mysterious story written by Frederick Frosset that revolves around a pilot. The story's narrator is a pilot who wanted to be with his family and enjoy a wholesome breakfast with them in England. He had to fly all the way from France to England for this. Once he crossed Paris, he came across storm clouds that, you know, looked like black mountains. However, he flew through the clouds and soon he realized that everything around him had turned entirely black. Nothing was visible to him outside the airplane as he lost control of it. Suddenly, he noticed that there was another airplane with no lights on its wings. The pilot of that airplane waved his hand and signaled him to follow. He blindly followed the other pilot since the radio signals of his plane were not reachable and even the fuel tank was low. So he had no other choice but to trust the other pilot. Soon he passed through the dark clouds and landed safely on the runway with the help of the other pilot. Upon landing, he inquired at the station who the other pilot was who helped him in such a critical situation as he wanted to thank him for saving his life. But the woman in the control center told him that there was no other airplane in the night sky other than his own airplane. So now it's up to you to decide who that other pilot was. That brings us to the end of our summary. Today we are going over a very important piece of work in world history which is the diary of Anne Frank. Now, you only have a very small part of that in your syllabus. So let's take a look at that and get right to it. Now, here we are. Before we get started, let me quickly read out to you what Anne Frank is saying here. Saying, this is a photo as I would wish myself to look all the time. Then I would maybe have a chance to come to Hollywood. All right. So... The Diary of Anne Frank is an autobiography of a young Jewish girl, Anne Frank, who wrote her thoughts in a diary. At first, she felt it was an unusual experience for her to pen down all her thoughts in pen and paper. She believed that no one in the near future would be interested to read about a young girl's past experiences from her diary. However, she still decided to write all of her thoughts in her diary and named it Kitty. Little did she know her diary would turn out to be one of the most read diaries in the world. In fact, one of the most read books in the world. So, she considered her diary to be her true and loyal friend as she was lonely and had no friends to talk to. Anne felt that her diary had more capacity to absorb thoughts than, you know, people with low patience levels. Further, she mentioned how much she loved her family, especially her adorable father who gifted her the diary on her 13th birthday. 
on 20th June 1942 and wrote about how her entire class was nervous about their exam results. Although she was confident about other subjects, she wasn't quite sure about maths. That's the case with a lot of us, right? So she and her friend G pleaded with the students to calm down and not make noise. But all in vain. She felt that about a quarter of the class were dummies who should be kept back in the same class as they did not participate in other activities. Besides, Anne also mentioned how there we are. The math teacher, Mr. Keesing, was annoyed by her talkative nature. He would often punish her with extra homework whenever she talked more during his class. In the first punishment, he asked her to write an essay on a chatterbox, which in itself was a weird topic for Anne. She gave good thought to the topic and decided to present convincing arguments in her essay, justifying her points in support of talking or being a chatterbox. She mentioned that she would try to improve herself, but she could not do anything about the trait that she inherited from her mother. When a teacher read the essay, he found it amusing and assigned her a second essay, an incorrigible chat box for her talkative nature. Now, incorrigible means someone who cannot be changed, okay? However, during the third lesson, Mr. Keesing had read enough of her justifications and assigned her another topic, which was quack, 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 said Mistress Chatterbox, as a punishment for her incorrigible habit. Anne almost ran out of thoughts after writing essays on similar topics previously. This time, she took the help of her friend, San, who was good at poetry and wrote the article from beginning to end in a satirical verse. When her teacher read the article, he took it lightly and he thoroughly enjoyed it. Since then, Anne was allowed to talk in class and was never assigned any extra homework by Mr. Keesing. That brings us to the end of From the Diary of Anne Frank. But obviously, it's very important to know the context. Anne Frank was a victim of the Holocaust, which was when Jews were put in concentration camps by Hitler and were persecuted just for being Jewish. And later on, Anne does lose her life at the age of 15 in a concentration camp along with her sister, the only surviving member of their family. Her father later gets the diary published so that people can read about her experiences, which started out as experiences that all of us can relate to at that age, but then took a very, very dark turn. And tells us about how mature, how sensitive and how beautiful Anne Frank was as a human being. All right, so that brings us to the end of the summary. Today we will be going over chapter 7 from First Flight, which is Glimpses of India. So this is divided into three parts. We'll be covering each part one by one. Let's start with part one. Part one is a baker from Goa. Now, this story is written by Lucio Rodriguez, who talks about the Goa that was once ruled by the Portuguese. Due to this reason, the people of the region are influenced by the Portuguese culture. Baking was the conventional profession of the Goan people and the bakers were known as padres there. This story particularly revolves around the bakers living in a Goan village. The author mentions how people in old times ate loaves of bread which were baked in large furnaces. Now the padres would come to sell these loaves in the street and would make a jingling sound with the bamboo whenever they arrived. He further added how the villagers enjoyed eating the loaves and bread bangles brought in baskets for children by these bakers during his childhood. The author described the special attire of the bakers called kabai, a single piece frock that would reach up to their knees. He also talks about how baking became the most profitable profession among people in Goa and many bakers led a prosperous life and their jackfruit-like physical appearance was a valid testimony of their well-being. 
Now let's get started with part two, which is about Kurg. Now Kurg is a story written by Lokesh Abrol. He described Kurg as the smallest district of Karnataka. The author said Kurg or Kodaga is a beautiful place that is located midway between Mangalore and Mysore. Now the heavenly city has evergreen forests, spices and coffee plantations and many tourists come to this destination during September to March every year. The air of this region is filled with the scent of coffee. The people of this region are very independent and have some Greek or Arabic connection since the time a part of Alexander's army had settled here permanently. They settled here and married the local people and the tradition continues to exist. The people of Kurk wear kupia, which is a long black coat that is quite similar to the ones worn by Arabs. Besides, the Kurgi people are very brave. One of the most significant regiments in the Indian army is the Kurg regiment. Notably, the first Indian commander-in-chief of the Indian army was General Karyappa, who hailed from this beautiful place. The hilly regions and forests of Kurg are a major source of water to the Kaveri River. Visitors who are interested in high adventure sports can have fun and a great time in this place and also explore the different types of animals particularly found in this region. Now, time for part 3, which is Tea from Assam. Tea from Assam is a story written by Arup Kumar Datta. This is the last story of the chapter, Glimpses of India. The story began with two friends, Rajveer and Pranjol, who were travelling to Assam. On their way, they bought fresh tree from a roadside vendor and discussed the special tea of this region. As they sipped the hot, steaming tea, Rajveer told Pranjol that over 80 crore cups of tea are being consumed every day throughout the world. Rajvi thoroughly enjoyed the scenic beauty of Assam, consisting of tea plantations and bushes, while Pranjol was engrossed in a detective book. Rajvi further explained to Pranjol about Assam as a place that is famous for having the largest tea plantations. However, no one knows the origin of tea in the region. According to a Chinese legend, a few leaves of tea accidentally fell in a pot of boiling hot water. Now the emperor enjoyed the delicious flavour of the liquid and that's how tea came into being. Rajveer also mentioned how an Indian legend, Bodhidharma, who was a Buddhist monk, cut off his eyelids because he fell asleep during meditation. In no time, Ten tea plants grew out of his eyelids and when these leaves were put in hot water, it helped in banishing sleep. Soon, both of them arrived at Mariani Junction, picked up their luggage and made their way towards Dekebari Tea Estate. On their way, they saw batches of tea pluckers who draped plastic aprons with bamboo baskets hung on their backs as they plucked the newly sprouted leaves. Pranjal's father had come to receive both of them. Pranjal's father was amazed at Rajvi's knowledge about tea plantations when he heard the young boy mention the second flush or sprouting period of tea that yields the best tea. Rajvi said that he was keen to learn more about the place from Pranjol's father. That brings us to the end of all three parts of Glimpses of India. Today we'll be covering chapter 8 from First Flight which is Mijbil the Otter. But before we get started, let me know if you're finding these sessions helpful and if you enjoy them, leave your feedback in the comments. Now, what are we waiting for? Let's get to it. So, Mitchbill the Otter, written by Gavin Maxwell, is a story which describes the beautiful bond between him and his pet otter, Mitchbill. 
The story begins with the writer Gavin Maxwell who was traveling to Basra in Iraq with his friend to collect and answer their mail from Europe. During their journey, Maxwell expressed his desire to keep an otter as a pet instead of a dog, as he felt very lonely after losing his pet dog earlier. His friend suggested he get an otter from the Tigris marshes in Iraq. When they reached the destination, his friend received the mail immediately, while Maxwell had to wait for a few more days to receive his mail. Once he received his mail, he took the sack that was brought by two Arabs carrying a message from his friend and discovered an otter inside it. He named the otter Mijbil and often referred to it as Mij. It took a little while for the little creature to adapt to its new surroundings. But soon, Midge got used to his surroundings. He started playing with water and learned to open the bathroom faucet on its own. The writer was thoroughly amazed with the games played by Midge. Soon, it was time for Maxwell to return to England with his pet otter. However, the British Airlines had a few restrictions that barred animals from travelling with human beings. So he booked another flight that allowed Mitch to travel with him. The new airlines insisted that Mitch should be packed in a box so that it didn't disturb the other co-passengers. So Maxwell arranged for a box. An hour before the flight, put Mitch Bill inside the box and left to grab a quick meal. When he returned, he found that Midge had injured himself inside the box. He took care of Midge Bill and cleaned the box and reached the airport. When he boarded the flight, he explained the entire incident that just happened to an air hostess who advised him to keep his pet on his lap rather than locking him inside the container. Maxwell was thankful for her kind words. But the moment he opened the box, Midge leaped out and vanished in thin air and it caused chaos in the flight. Many co-passengers were shocked seeing the little creature moving around. But the kind-hearted air hostess took Midge and handed it back to Maxwell in no time. Soon they reached London and Maxwell thanked the crew for their support on board. Now in London, Midge got used to its surroundings gradually. It started playing with marbles and ping pong balls. The writer was also amazed by the game that Midge had developed with his broken suitcase. Maxwell often took Midge for a walk and the people of London would make wild guesses about his pet. People confused Midge for a baby seal, a beaver, a squirrel and there were still a few more who would refer to him as a hippo. The most shocking response that Maxwell received from a labourer who was digging a hole when he asked him, Here, mister, what is that supposed to be? <laughs> that brings us to the end of our cute little story with Maxwell's pet otter, Mitch Bill. Today, we will be covering Madam Rides the Bus from First Flight, so let's get right to it. The story, Madam Rides the Bus, written by Vali Kanan and illustrated by R.K. Narayan, is a sensitive story of a young 8-year-old girl called Valli Ammai. Now, Valli was always curious to explore the outside world. She didn't have anyone who was her age living in her street. And so, her favourite pastime was to stand on the doorway of her house and watch all that was happening outside on the street. She would watch people get on and off the bus that travelled between her village and the nearest town. The bus filled passengers, filled the bus that was filled with passengers always filled her with this sense of unending joy. She had a strong urge to take a bus ride to explore the adventurous bus journey. Now, something as simple as a bus journey uh, filled her with all of this sense of adventure. Hence, she collected information about the bus timings by listening to the conversations of the people taking the bus ride. Soon she learned that the bus journey from her village to the nearest town was approximately 6 miles. So the bus fare cost 30 paise 
for a one-way ride. So Valli started saving enough money to take a ride on the bus. Valli planned to travel in the bus during the afternoon when her mother would be asleep. So she stood on the roadside waiting for the bus. As soon as the bus arrived, she told the conductor she wants to go to town. The conductor happened to be a jovial person and referred to her as Madam and told her to hop into the bus and take her seat. She got into the bus quickly and noticed that the bus was painted in white colour with green stripes and it looked brand new. The bus seats were luxurious and the ride was comfortable. During her journey, Valli enjoyed looking at the greenery outside and you know the scenic natural beauty from the bus. She was thoroughly enjoying her bus ride and was amused when she saw a young cow that ran wildly in front of the bus and crossed the road. Now, the driver blew the uh, shrill horn as the cow crossed the road. This was a very fascinating experience for Valli as she realized her dream of traveling in a bus had finally come true. So, as Valli enjoyed watching the beautiful landscape outside, the bus started getting empty as the passengers got down in their stops that were on the way. Soon, the conductor asked her if she would like to roam about the stalls in the town, but she told him that she had very limited money which she needed to take the bus back to her village. So, Valli stayed on the bus and took a ticket from the conductor to return to her village. As the bus started again, she, on the way, noticed a dead cow and upon seeing the dead cow, realized that it was the same cow that she had seen on her way to town that ran wildly in front of her bus. Looking at the sight of the dead cow made her very sad as she tried to make sense of the meaning of life and death. Soon, the bus dropped her off at the bus stop near her home and she returned home just on time and no one even realized that she was gone. Valli heard her mom and aunt talking about the meaning of life and how it's difficult to know and understand everything happening in the world. Valli agreed to this and left her aunt and mother amused and confused with her response. Valli smiled to herself knowing that her mom and aunt would not understand the reason behind her smile. That brings us to the end of the summary. Today we will be covering the sermon at Banaras from First Flight. So without further ado, let's get right to it. The sermon at Banaras illustrates the valuable preachings of Lord Buddha. So Lord Buddha was born as a prince named Siddharth Gautam in North India. When he was just 12 years old, he was sent away from home to study the sacred Hindu scriptures. He returned four years later and married a beautiful princess. They had a healthy son and led a life of royalty for 10 years. Being a part of the royal family, he was always protected from the sufferings and unpleasant happenings that go on in the world. One fine day, while he went out hunting, the prince met an ailing man, an old man. He saw a funeral procession and a monk begging for alms. Now, he was moved by all of these encounters and soon he left royalty to seek enlightenment for all the sorrows that he had witnessed. He attained salvation and sat under a tree and renamed it as the Bodhi tree, which means a tree of wisdom. He began preaching and sharing his new understandings. Soon he became... Buddha and people start calling him Buddha which means the awakened or the enlightened. He gave his first sermon in Banaras, the holy city on the banks of the river Ganga. In one of his sermons, he taught about a lady, Kisa Gautami, whose only son had died. So now that's what we are going to uh, learn about in this lesson. So she was, Kisa Gautami was devastated and was in extreme grief for the sudden loss of her son. She went from one house to another seeking help and medicine to bring her son back to life. People thought that she had lost her mind because of her grief. One day she met a man who directed her to approach 
Lord Buddha for his guidance. She felt that Lord Buddha could possibly help this lady who is in crisis. Now, Kisa Gautami approached the monk as directed and begged him to cure her son. Lord Buddha asked her to procure mustard seeds from a house where the family had never lost a family member, relative or friend. So Gautami was filled with a ray of hope and immediately went in search of such a house and uh, went from one house to another. But she could not find a single house where nobody had died. She felt disheartened and finally realized how selfish she had been in desperately searching for something that wasn't even possible to achieve. Thus, she understood that humans are mortal beings and all those who have come to the earth have to leave behind all their relations and belongings and die one day. This was the lesson that Lord Buddha taught her and wanted her to understand that life and death is the cycle of the universe and no one can escape it. Lord Buddha taught a valuable lesson. All those feelings of sorrow and grief only escalate man's suffering and pain. It deteriorates one's health and worsens the current situation. Therefore, a wise person is one who is completely aware of how Mother Nature functions and must not lose hope or remain in constant grief for something that is bound to happen. It is only then that one can enjoy life and stay happy and blessed in life. That brings us to the end of our summary. Today we'll be going over the play, The Proposal by Anton Chekhov. So let's get right to it. Now the chapter, The Proposal, is a comedy drama written by the famous Russian playwright Anton Chekhov that is about two wealthy families who seek to ha make ties with each other to increase their estates by marrying into the other family. Now the play begins with Ivan Lomov, who visited Stepan Shubukov, a wealthy neighbor of Lomov. Now, Lomov is a wealthy person himself who has dressed very neatly and had come to seek Chubukov's 25-year-old daughter, Natalia Stepanovna's hand and in marriage. So initially, Chubukov was curious about why Lomov suddenly showed up like this, dressed uh, so neatly in a suit and assumed that the young man had actually come to ask for money, which he might not return. Now, Lomov is a 35-year-old gentleman and he suffered from severe heart throbbing and became upset very easily. He thought that Natalia was an excellent housekeeper, a well-educated and average-looking woman who would be an ideal partner to marry. When Chubukov heard about the proposal, he was glad and embraced Lomov as a worthy son-in-law. He immediately rushed inside to call his daughter Natalia. When Natalia arrived, Lomov began the conversation about how both the families share a cordial relationship. He says, the Lomovs and Chubukovs have always had the most friendly and I might almost say the most affectionate regard for each other. And as you know, my land is a near neighbor of yours. You will remember that my oxen meadows touch your birch woods. As he spoke about his land oxen meadows, Natalia objected that the land belonged to her family. Now Lomov yelled back stating that the land belonged to him. Both of them had a very heated argument on this topic until Lomov had a sudden palpitation attack and numbness in his feet. So in no time, Natalia's father, Chubukov, arrived and the father-daughter duo started quarreling with Lomov. Feeling insulted, Lomov rushed out of the house. As Chubukov continued to defame the young man, he accidentally mentioned to Natalia about Lomov's intention to marry her and his marriage proposal. Hearing this, Natalia immediately regretted insulting Lomov and asked her father to bring him back. 
Chupakov rushed out of the house immediately to call Lomov. When the young man returned, Natalia started a conversation this time about their dogs. Again, in no time, a second round of debate ensued between her and Lomov, where she mentioned that her dog Squeezer was better than Lomov's dog Guess. Soon, Chubukov also entered the scene and the argument got worse. All the three people began quarrelling and soon Lomov fainted with another attack of palpitation. Seeing this, Natalia asked her father to wake up Lomov as she expressed her desire that she liked him too. Suddenly, when Lomov made a movement, they offered him some water to drink and Chubukov put Natalia's hand over his hand. They agreed to marry and Chubukov gave his blessings to the couple and said that it's a weight off his shoulders. Even after the happy declarations and everything coming back to normal, the quarrel persisted as Natalia again said Squeezer was better than Guess. However, Lomov was again adamant and refused to accept that his dog Guess was worse than Squeezer. The curtain went down as the verbal fight continued among these very odd characters. That brings us to the end of our summary.